So Jennifer, if you're also ready, I think I will kick it off um, and I will make sure that um, I'm checking whether new participants are coming in. But very warm welcome from my side. My name is Millie um, and I am one of the org uh, members of Berlin community. Um, I am not sure how many of you are actually familiar with this community, but I will kind of give you a small introduction of who we are. And I'm very curious to also learn who you are. And then um, I will have this honor to introduce our speaker and the topic uh, for which you're all here today. So Berlin Community is basically a platform. It's a community that is meant for learning professionals from very different backgrounds and, and perspectives on what learning is and who actually the audience is. We have been running a lot of offline events uh, right now, also expanding and exploring our skills in the online world. So we have been running events, um, um, webinars, like, just like this one. We have ha had a couple of activities where we uh, run um, match the mentors and mentees and all of that was within the, the training, facilitation, L&D, instructional de design field. And we um, are really trying to make this knowledge sharing happen and start conversation on actually bringing more innovation uh, when it comes to a specifically German ecosystem. We are based in Berlin, but we have right now opportunity to really have people from everywhere. Um, and I hope for many of you actually know us, but if you don't, you can definitely check us on very different channels to stay updated on the events that we are running, the activities that we are running and resources that we are collecting as we go. Um, and um, I know that we have already people um, uh, waiting for the agenda to start, but before, before we go in, I would really like to see in the chat, just um, if you can quickly tell us where you are dialing in tonight um, and what is your current role, just to see this diversity that we know that this topic uh, attracts. If you can just type in the chat quickly, um, basically, where do you dial in and what is your current role? So I will give you a couple of seconds, go ahead. and share that with us. All right, Poland, Berlin, so a lot of Alex designers, I mean, learning designers. Executive assistant, hi Francisca, instructional designer. Oh, Italy, based in Berlin. Great. We have coaches, education coordinator. I love how this field is very versatile also in terms of titles and, and, and roles and responsibilities people have. Really cool. Um, thank you for that. Uh, and I would like to now kind of open up the floor for the tonight's topic. Uh, and to introduce, we have honor to have Jennifer Dorman with us, whose experience is very rich and very um, diverse. So the topic for tonight is cognitive biases and strategies that we as learning professionals can actually identify and work on when it comes to delivering um, awesome learning experiences. So it has been very hot topic for um, a long time. And I'm happy that we have a professional like you, Jennifer. First of all, welcome. It's really nice to have you tonight. Thank you for having me. Um, and I really love the, the combination of your background. I will give you a floor in a second um, of someone who has a strong UX design, um, linguistics de design. You have been teaching, you're working as an instructional design um, currently at Babel. Um, and it's really nice to see your, your perspective that you have gathered over the years on this very interesting topic. So I am very glad to now pass you the mic uh, for all of you who will be uh, with us in the next hour and a half. 
uh, really buckle up. It's going to be a lot of resources, a lot of input. So make sure that you have some refreshment next to you. And um, whenever you have a question, you slide out to send, send us questions. I will be monitoring the chat and uh, making sure that at the end of the, the webinar, we will go through that and cover as much as we can. Remember that uh, we will follow up with the resources coming out from this uh, webinar. So don't worry if you miss anything, it's recorded and uh, we will follow up with all the materials as well. So without further ado, thank you again for spending time with us tonight and happy learning. Jennifer, the floor is yours. I will stop sharing and quickly, yes. Great, Millie, before you mute yourself, um, are you yes. seeing my screen? Yes, I can see. So excellent. Great. Thanks a lot. And feel free to interrupt if something pops up in the chat or on Slido that you think is pertinent for us to stop and discuss before before we get to the Q and A at the end. Yes, I will be monitoring. Okay. Thanks. Enjoy. Thanks. Well, welcome everyone. Um, one thing that I will say before I get started is that this is going to be a little bit more of an interactive session. So if you are joining us on Zoom um, on your laptop, it would be great to have maybe a, a tab of a internet browser open, or maybe if you have another mobile device hand, you know, handy, that would be good because we're gonna be actually doing a little bit of actual input. Um, so let me start by just Kind of following up a little bit on Millie's introduction, um, I am an instructional designer at Babbel here in Berlin. Um, if you're not familiar with Babbel, it is a language learning ecosystem, probably best known for its language app. And as Millie also mentioned, um, an instructional designer is a really, really broad term. And I see people with this title or learning experience designer um, as well that do all sorts of things. And so, what I have done in the past um, for instructional design is a lot of course production um, at the university level, at the sort of the public education level in the States. Uh, but what I'm doing right now is a lot more of user experience design. Um, so I, I don't work in L&D per se um, at, my, at Babel, uh, rather I work with an agile engineering team. Um, and so my job is essentially to ensure the continuity um, and the value of the language uh, experience for all of Babel's learners. Now, since I mentioned that this is going to be uh, very much an interactive session, we are going to be using a service called Menti, uh, which is free. The website is, uh, you see it at the top of the screen, um, menti.com. When you open that up, and you can also, by the way, open this up on a mobile phone browser if you would like. The code is 8558 54. And I'd like to just get your mood this evening. I will say here in Berlin, for those of you that are here, it's pretty, it was pretty warm today. Um, so maybe you're feeling very, sun, you know, very sunny or partly sunny. Not sure what the weather is like on the East Coast, um, where a couple of, couple of you are joining us from. Um, but if you could actually just fill that out real quickly, that would give me a good indication. So let's see what people are feeling right now. Sunny so far, nice. Oh, I just realized when I refreshed my screen, sorry that the code changed again. Oh, a little stormy. We'll give it about another 30 seconds. Okay, I have to admit that I'm one of the partly sunnies right now. But that's only because I am not used to the I'm not used to the, the heat wave and I haven't gotten my my brain isn't yet ready for this. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm glad to see that the majority of us are feeling pretty positive um, and sunny. So let's dive right in. Now, the next thing I'd like to kind of get a sense for is what you already have in terms of background familiarity with some of the topics we're going to talk about. So my next question is how familiar you are um, with terms like pedagogy, andragogy, motivation theory, cognitive biases, and behavioral economics. Um, so you can go ahead and use the slider. So never heard of it, or I use it regularly with my work. I figure the pedagogy and andragogy would be pretty high. Well, excellent. 
Well, fantastic. Some of you have already um, heard a little bit about behavioral economics. That's good. Okay. Well, thanks for that, because that gives me a little bit of insight as to some of the terms that maybe we need to unpack a little bit more um, during the session today. Um, so if you have this Mentimeter link open, just keep it open on your browser. We're going to be coming right back to it with the same code a few times during the presentation. So let's start off with what makes Billy special, because obviously Billy's the reason that you came here tonight. Um, Billy is not actually really all that special. It's a set of bookshelves. It is, however, IKEA's number one selling product worldwide since it was launched in the 1970s, I think. Um, I, I believe the most recent uh, data that I saw, because yes, I actually did research Billy bookshelves. There's something like a set of Billy bookshelves that it's sold worldwide every seven seconds, which is crazy. I have two sets of Billy bookshelves in my apartment. Um, this is not necessarily something that's important to education from the perspective of a set of bookshelves, but the Billy bookshelves illustrates something that is one of the most powerful cognitive biases that impact how we make decisions. Um, and this bias is actually called the IKEA effect. <laughs> and the IKEA effect more or less uh, means that we tend to value those experiences or those artifacts or those things that we put some of our own effort into. And so even though a set of Billy bookshelves is not that big of a financial investment, um, perhaps, the fact that we brought that flat pack home with us, we put it up, we anchored it to our wall, hopefully, if you have a lot of books on them, um, is something that makes us value the bookshelves a lot more than the actual, say, monetary value of that bookshelf. And it's part of the reason why very often our learners tend to engage an awful lot more with our experiences if they've invested some of their own self in them, if they've been able to personalize it. In fact, for a lot of app designers, one of the things that we see is just by virtue, for instance, of having an avatar. So someone can personalize their avatar. Um, something as simple as that is often enough of an investment to make them want to continue using that particular service. Now, one of the things that we consider when we think about something like a cognitive bias. We have to kind of understand where, where this is situated in terms of behavioral science. And I do apologize. I tend to move a lot and I'm standing right now. So don't get seasick if you're watching the video as well. Um, that's just kind of the way I am. Behavioral science is not a new field. I mean, for enough of you have backgrounds in pedagogy, andragogy. You've heard of people like Pavlov and Skinner. So you know behaviorism, behavioral science is not new. However, in the 1970s, behavioral science really sort of exploded in terms of looking at not just why people may think the way they do or how we can make people do what we do or what we want them to do, but also how we can use some behavioral science uh, strategies to predict what people will do and also help nudge them um, along the way. Um, so there are two terms that I'll, I'll use periodically um, this evening. One of them is heuristics and the other is cognitive biases. Now, heuristics is essentially the understanding that our brain um, has to sift through massive amounts of stimuli. I mean, think about this. Over the course of the day, the number of decisions that you have to make, or even just the number of different types of information sources that bombard your brain, if we had to actually process each and every one of these consciously, we would literally be paralyzed. We, we could not function. So what heuristics does is essentially helps to create some shortcuts. So think of it this way. If you have a certain set of conditions or a certain set of stimuli that comes in and you tend to initially respond a certain way and you repeat that response, your brain creates a little bit of a shortcut so that the next time you face that same um, stimuli or the same situation, your brain is automatically going to give you that intuitive gut feeling about how you should respond to this. And to be quite honest, this is a great thing that our brain does. I mean, not only does it help us to make decisions relatively quickly, but it was, it's actually quite um, 
an advantage in evolutionary terms. I mean, maybe we don't have to necessarily worry about large, you know, predators uh, in our environment or that sort of thing. It's not like the, you know, the ancient humans, so to speak, living in caves and that sort of thing. But we do have to sometimes make decisions relatively quickly. And so heuristics gives us that shortcut. Problem is, sometimes they have a sort of a glitch in the matrix, sort of like a, a heuristic failure. Um, and this is where cognitive biases come in. Because when we consider that, generally speaking, sort of like as a species, humans tend to act in a rational way. We tend to do what's in our best interest. But individually, we often do things sort of irrationally that are against our own personal best interests or the collective um, best interests of our community. And part of that is because very often these shortcuts in our brain, these heuristics, predict certain outcomes and they sometimes block us from consciously making the decision that would be in our best interest or that would help us to achieve our goals. Now, there's a ton of, there's a ton of cognitive biases. I mean, th there are literally hundreds. Um, and you definitely cannot read all of this, but I do want to point this out because this infographic is um, fairly well known, the Cognitive Bias Codex. Um, and you can see this on online. In fact, when you send, we send the links out uh, from after the session, you'll actually be able to click on that link. But this cognitive bias codex essentially looks at all of the various cognitive biases and buckets them um, into a couple of categories. So certain biases that help to predict um, what we should remember or what happens when we have too much information, have to make a very quick decision, or what if we don't have enough information, all of that is sort of some of these buckets. And these different buckets and these different cognitive biases are really powerful tools for instructional designers because it helps us to understand why our learners make some of the decisions that they make, especially when we know that they're making decisions that are not in their best interest. Now, as you know, I work at Babbel. Babbel is not a free service. People pay to learn with Babbel. And yet we see sometimes people who have paid, so they've made a financial investment in learning a language, and then they don't use the service often enough to actually make a dent in their language learning experience. So they made a decision that was in their best interests, and yet somehow something is blocking them from actually realizing that. And so cognitive biases are one of the ways that we are able to sort of diagnose um, what those blockers are and help to design experiences that enable our learners to actually achieve their goals. So how do cognitive biases actually impact learning? Well, we first have to maybe do a little bit of backtracking. Um, a lot of you already had some familiarity with the difference between pedagogy and andragogy. Um, they're bo they both have something to do with learning, but if you look at the roots, so pedagogy tends to often be referred to as like the learning that occurs in childhood. Um, and there are certain characteristics here um, that make designing for children um, maybe not so much cut and dry, but a little bit more expected from the sense that it is still very much teacher directed. I don't mean, you know, direct instruction, lecturing, but teachers are designing the experience. The children tend to have fewer life experiences that they're bringing into the learning experience that might cause those heuristic failures, so those cognitive biases to block them. Um, and very often, the, like, the motivations are, are extrinsic, so they get a pass or a fail grade. Those are the sorts of things that tend to motivate uh, children as learners. But I think pretty much all of us here are dealing with older learners. So we're, de we're dealing with either adults or, or even teenagers. I know there's a little bit of debate in the learning community as to whether or not, say, a high school or gymnasium student is closer to like the pedagogy side or the andragogy side. Um, but think about your slightly older learners and keep in mind that they're not coming in as blank slates to the learning experience that you are creating. They are coming in with a lot of existing knowledge and a lot of life experience that can sometimes kind of color or frame how they respond to the 
learning materials or the experience or the activities or even the set of expectations that you put out for them in, in that learning experience. So it's important to keep in mind, one, that our adult learners are coming in with a lot more experience. That means a lot more data in their brain. They have a lot more of that experience that is going to frame those heuristics and those cognitive biases. And also that adult learners need to have a, a much stronger sense of autonomy and control over their learning experience. So those aren't the only you know, key things, but those are the two that I would ask you to keep in the back of your mind as we move forward. Okay. Now, when we talk about behavioral economics, we are actually talking about specifically identifying for your usually adult learners, something called the intention action gap. Um, and this is essentially the difference between what someone wants to do, what they know is in their best interest, and what they actually end up doing. Um, and we know with adult learners, sometimes that can actually be um, pretty challenging. And we also know that very often with adult learners, we see them you know, doing things that maybe sabotage their learning goals a little bit, especially because we assume that an adult learner knows better. And it's not that they don't know better, they do know better, but some of these cognitive biases block them from realizing the type of goals that they would like to have. Okay. So this behavioral economics as a concept, um, when you look in the literature, sometimes you might see this referred to as nudge theory or choice architecture. Um, but behavioral economics is, is more or less a subset of behavioral science. And as a subset of behavioral science, um, this is really the, unders, or the science of understanding why these gaps occur, why there's a gap between the intention and the action, how to predict it, and also how to design in a way to help individuals overcome them. Um, and by designing, I'm talking usually about subtle interventions um, that guide the learner's choices without actually restricting them. Because once again, keep in mind, we're talking about adult learners and we want them to have autonomy. So it's not like in a you know, elementary school classroom where you can just sort of create the experience and people have, you know, your students have to follow along. Your adult learners have to make that conscious decision uh, to be invested in that. And so for learning experience designers, an understanding of behavioral economics helps us to better diagnose learner problems helps us to identify the types of behaviors that learners need to actually engage in in order to achieve their goals, and then also which interventions that we can create um, or design for to help nudge learners um, to you know, make the right choices. It also helps us to define very specific hypotheses. So we want to figure out how do we improve a specific course or how do we improve on a specific outcome that we have for our learning group um, using cognitive biases um, to frame that helps us to really refine a hypothesis and develop an intervention that we can experiment with, so actually test for. And from the perspective of learners, it's always interesting. Um, sometimes people refer to this as like, you know, you're in the, you know, in the matrix, you got the red pill and the blue pill, and if you take the one, then you can never, you know, you'll never be the same. And I hear a lot of people when they're first getting into behavioral economics and they're looking at cognitive biases, they start to say, Oh, now, now, I, now I know why I did this, or now I can't, I can't get over the fact that I, I have choice overload. And in a sense, you become very strongly as a, as a learner, as an individual, um, a lot more metacognitive. And so it can help you then as a learner, um, improve your goal setting, um, the, improve your, the planning um, to get from you know, the start and the realization of a goal or an objective. And it also can help you to better assess um, how you're doing along the way. Now, I mentioned that behavioral economics can help us to sort of refine all of this, like refine what the problem is and all of that. Um, I want to provide you, I mean, this is not the only uh, behavioral economics type model out there, but this is the one that, that I personally use uh, most frequently, and this is the one I find most actionable. Um, and this boost model is something that was developed by the Impactually organization. If you if you're interested in learning more about behavioral economics in general, um, Impactually has a, a course online, a, a self-paced um, 
e-learning course called Designing Nudges that is a really well-planned and very actionable in terms of actually taking some of your the challenges you have in your day-to-day -day at your work, um, taking that in and actually playing around with it. Uh, so I would definitely encourage you, if you get a chance, check out Impactually's Designing Nudges course um, to get some more information. So this boost model that they've designed has um, essentially, obviously, you see, you know, acronym. The first step is to, first of all, consider what your entire outcome is. Um, an outcome is something that is, is broader. Um, if you're working on like the business, you know, the business side, so the enterprise side, you might refer to your outcome as your key performance indicator, so your KPI. If you're in the classroom, um, whether that's with adults um, or with children, your desired outcome might be something broader, like a gra graduation, so a graduation diploma or something like that. An outcome is something that you can't actually nudge or intervene on because it is not a single, a single behavior or even um, a, a single decision that your learner would, would have to take in order to achieve that. An outcome is many decisions and many behaviors over probably a wide context and a long span of time. So in identifying the behavior, you start with that broad outcome you think about who your target group is. So it might be all your learners or it might be a specific segment of your learners. And then you start to think about what types of specific behaviors that that target group would have to take and engage in in order to be successful and achieve that outcome. So to give you an example of something like this from what I do at Babbel, if my desired outcome is that my learners will speak the language that they want to speak like they've always wanted to speak it. That's obviously something that is very, very broad. So I might say, okay, we have millions of Pebble learners. I can't design for every single one of them at a given time. Maybe I'll look at a core group of our learners, our, maybe our striving learners who are not coming into the app on a regular basis. These are maybe people who only log in every couple of weeks or once a month. Um, so clearly they're not coming in as often as they need to in order to actually learn a language. So they need more practice. So maybe I say that now this target group of sort of moderately inactive uh, learners, they're my target group. And what are the behaviors that they have to take? Well, they have to open up the app, right? So they have to actually come into the app, right? So that could be one behavior that I might look at. They have to start a learning experience. So they literally have to click and start a lesson or start a review. Then they have to finish it. So not just start, but then they have to finish it. And then we need them to come back within a few days so they can consolidate their learning and continue to, to practice um, with the vocabulary or the skills or the conversational um, practice that they need to learn that language. With the boost model, I will take one of those behaviors, just one. And then I will start to consider what is blocking our learner from doing this. So if the issue is they're just not coming into the app as often as not enough, I wanna consider, well, if they're not opening up Babbel, what else are they doing on their phone? You know, what are the other behaviors they're taking instead of the one we want them to take? That will then allow me to start to look at some of the cognitive biases and say, okay, well, maybe this bias is, you know, making it a little bit challenging for them to make the decision to open Babel, right? Maybe we, we, we can reframe something. And then that's where we get to the outline stage. In the outline stage, we take the, the bias that we've identified, and I'll give you lots of examples of these biases in just a minute, but the bias that we've identified, and now we start to brainstorm what are ways that we can intervene so that when our learner has to actually make a decision to engage in this behavior that we think that they need to engage in, what can we do to nudge them or make it easier for them to make the right decision? So these interventions are, are individual nudges or design changes that we can test. And this is where we move into the study stage. So, when we think about actually creating an experiment, I mean, really like a scientific type experiment, we have now, in a sense, created our entire hypothesis. We know who our target group is. We know the specific behavior that we want them to engage in. We are placing a bet on which cognitive bias we think is probably the most influential. 
in terms of blocking them. And then we're designing an intervention specifically for that bias. So we test this, we take a look, is it successful, is it not? If it is, let's iterate on it, let's adapt it, potentially scale it up. But one of the things that I would mention here before we actually start to look at this um, in a, a more detailed way is that a lot of the people that I, I've worked with in terms of looking at um, applying this boost model um, to L&D or to app design or whatever, a lot of them try to be too broad. So they get to that point where they have the outcome, they have the behavior, they think they have the bias, but then instead of just isolating a single intervention, they do several. And so when they go to test it, they have a difficult time isolating which nudge, which design change, which intervention actually moved the needle, actually helped the learner to make that right decision. Um, and that's, a, that's very often a, a problem. So here I would suggest that when you actually design something like this and you think about experimenting with it, that you focus in on one specific intervention at a time so that you can isolate it, test it, evaluate its success. It doesn't mean you can't test other things down the road, of course, um, but it also gives you a much clearer idea of what it needs and what your learner needs in order to be successful. So when I talked about these different sorts of interventions, we said that this could be a nudge, so something very slight. This could be a design change. Um, this refined matrix is also from the Impactfully Designing uh, Nudges course, but they essentially bucket all different types of interventions or nudges into four basic categories. So your design change or whatever it might be can reframe the decision. So you're presenting the information in a slightly different way. Um, this can mean, you know, like flipping. So something like a flipped classroom type um, environment would be an example of reframing, for instance. You could facilitate. So in other words, if it's, dip, you know, if there's a lot of clutter on a, a screen, a facilitation, for instance, for our learners might be a, a nudge to install Babel or put the Babel app right on their home screen. In other words, it's right there on their home screen. It's not buried in a folder. It's not buried under, you know, four or five pages of home screens, that sort of thing. In other words, removing a few of the barriers um, that could distract your learner. Encouraging. We're all working with, um, with, with learners in some capacity, so in encouraging the target behavior to make it more appealing um, or more desirable. And then, of course, we can incentivize. Um, and incentivize here, especially, once again, with adult learners, incentivize is something that you really want to make sure that it's not a, a random reward. It, they're not getting you know, monetary bonuses or something like that um, to do the thing that you, you want them to do, um, but rather that incentive actually matches um, in a very sort of authentic and organic way the behavior you're trying to nudge. So don't worry if this sounds a little bit abstract at the moment because we are actually going to go through a boost model um, with, a, with an LMD focus in, in mind in a few minutes. Um, but I want to take a, a quick, you know, quick check right now to see, because this is a lot of, you know, a lot of different terminology and, and a lot of, you know, maybe things that are very brand new. Um, so I want to give you an opportunity um, to throw some questions out on the chat. Um, if there's something that you want me to go into a little bit more detail on now. Um, if not, once again, feel free to post things to the Slido and we can address them at the end. So I'm going to give it a second to take a look and see if there's um, anything that pops up in the chat. We do have one on the slide that I think might be interesting right now from Carolina. So she's asking about self-determined learning. Um, how would you relate pedagogy and where would you place it in your approaches? So right. I'm sorry, self-determined self learning, is that what you yes, said? Yes, exactly. So where so, would you relate to what you said right now and in your approaches? Okay. So if if, for instance, we're talking about self-determined learning, and Carolina, jump in, on, jump in on the chat if I'm misunderstanding your question, please. Um, but if you're talking about self-determined learning in terms of something that's like, say, self-paced, um, so that the learner has to, you know, maybe complete modules or go through things at their own pace, and there isn't sort of that push or that time box that's forcing them um, to do things at a certain time. One of the things that we often consider, uh, because obviously with, with e-learning and stuff like that, very often it is a self-paced environment, so not time box. If that's the case, then one of the, and I'll go back here, 
one of the obstacles that, always, that often comes into play um, is something like present bias, for instance, uh, which essentially makes, makes it more difficult for people to prioritize something um, if the reward or the outcome or, you know, I, you know the, the feeling or the accomplishment is kind of far away. Um, it's easier, for instance, you know, for, or maybe I shouldn't say easier, um, but someone could get a much more immediate reward if they pick up their phone and do a little bit of Instagram scrolling versus the longer term reward of spending a few minutes every day on Babbel, learning a language and potentially not being able to use that language for several weeks. Um, so when we think about something like a self-determined or self-paced learning experience, reframing in a way that helps to you know, bring the, the end result, um, that focus of that ultimate goal, um, brings that more into the, the forefront so people understand what that is at the beginning. That can help to encourage people to move through that self-paced um, experience a little bit more. And I, I think I see some things coming in chat, so I'm not sure if that means, if I miss or misunderstood your question. Yeah, you can see, I think Carolina is, can you yeah. see the chat? I am, I'm just opening it up. Okay, sorry. I had to scroll from the very top. Um, okay, so we were, we're talking a little bit, <coughs> pardon me, that's just allergies, <laughs> nothing more serious. Um, when we're talking then specifically about self-determination, I think then you're, oops, wrong way. You're thinking more, here we go. You're thinking more um, about the, this idea that the, the learner is sort of defining um, what the process is. The learner is defining, so the adult learner, I should say. The adult learner is defining um, what they are, you know, what they want to achieve, how they want to get there. Um, and sometimes then the, the issue is they might not they might not recognize which tools um, or which skills or which experiences um, and in which sort of scaffolded and sort of which sequence would best help them to get that ultimate, um, you know, that ultimate goal or that outcome that they're, they're seeking. Um, so then in that case, something like uh, a targeted like learning plan that provides them sort of with a with a little bit of a suggestion for step by step, but also giving them once again that freedom to be able to jump out to a library of resources to dive deeper into something that they are very specifically um, or personally interested in. Um, that also helps to, you know, frame this in a slightly better way. Okay, now let me just double check. Okay. Oh, I see another question here. Oh, okay, that wasn't a question. It was Thanks, more Dad. Of a <laughs> Thanks, Dad. <laughs> and let me know. We do have one more question, but let me know if you have planned that, or we can come back to that uh, later because I think it's relevant also um, for the Q and A's. Is uh, maybe because it is how do you define which bias you will work on? So maybe you will uh, then go deep dive into that. Uh, yeah. We're going to dive a little bit deeper into that. So, all right, we, yeah. we can come back to this question, but I will then let you go. Okay. All right. So then let's actually kind of put this in practice. So let's unpack these cognitive biases uh, just a little bit. Once again, I, I mentioned before, you, you saw the, the cognitive bias codex, it's just hundreds of cognitive biases. Um, and if you just try to like look at that and try to figure out which one, and there's so many, and very often, to be quite honest, there's more than one bias um, that's playing a, a role in why someone is not doing what they want to do. In other words, accounting for that intention action gap. So what I put here on this slide um, are the, are the my top biases. In other words, I don't mean my personal top biases, but the ones that I see um, impacting most frequently uh, the the or blocking most frequently my, my learners from achieving their goals. Um, in fact, I even made it a little bit, <laughs> a little bit more uh, specific by bolding the ones um, that are the, that have been from my experience, um, the most powerful. When I say, you know, obviously I, I can't, 
I can't follow one of my learners at Babel around and try to figure out, is, is it the curse of knowledge or is it the spacing effect um, or the over justification effect that's causing them to not achieve the goals that they want to achieve? Uh, because of course, I'm talking about learners as an aggregate. So millions of learners, and I'm talking about buckets of learners. Um, if you're working in a smaller, a smaller setting, so you have really just a, a handful of learners, you might be able to actually you know, get a little bit more detail through surveys or interviews or discussions uh, with them. But these are the ones that I personally have found that when I design experiments and I design interventions for these particular cognitive biases, I tend to be the most successful in terms of nudging my learners into the behavior um, that would help them to be successful in this case of learning a language. Incidentally, the link that I have down here that you'll be able to um, click on when you get the link to the actual slides, um, this is actually a printable set of cognitive biases. It's literally, they're like flashcards um, for, for different cognitive biases, ones that specifically impact learning environments um, more, more directly. And these are these all provide a really nice, quick overview. Um, and if you're working, say, with a design team or, um, or a teaching team, this is actually a really nice um, sort of manipulative to have um, during that conversation because then it's very visual. You can put it right up on the wall. Or you can put it down in front of you and really do some brainstorming and ideating around that. So that's just a, a quick little, I think you do have to sign up for a mailing list, um, but of course you can if you don't want the mailing list after the fact, um, you can certainly cancel it, but it is actually a really nice resource. So we're gonna now actually take a look at um, an L&D example of what the boost model might look like in action. So once again, behaviors, obstacles, outlines, studies, and tailors. Um, so let's consider this scenario. So let's say in, in working, um, for, the, for those of you that are working in L&D, so at a company, um, you work with a lot of new hires, right? And very often you have um, specific types of training modules that a new hire has to complete within a, a short period of time. I mean, sometimes these are just suggested, um, but other times, I mean, th this could be like a, a really important time box requirement because there's some sort of a compliance um, issue associated with it. So let's say that your big outcome is that your new hires complete the required training modules within say four weeks, okay? So that's your outcome. Now, let's consider what all of the possible behaviors might be and let's say, okay, the behavior that we say is the most significant that would potentially make the, you know, have the greatest impact in moving our metrics so that more of our new hires complete those required training uh, modules is that they actually, from our course library online, select the mandatory onboarding courses, like the actual the courses that we, we need. So let's say you have a really, really um, active L&D department and you have tons of courses and maybe when your new hire gets to your, you know, the onboarding or the professional development page, um, there are just so many courses in there they maybe get distracted by something that they're super interested in and they and those required mandatory onboarding courses sort of fall through the cracks. Not because your new hire doesn't want to do them, but because you have so many awesome offerings that they, just, they opt for something else. So we may consider then that the obstacle or the cognitive bias um, that is at play here is something called choice overload, um, which is something that is very prevalent in digital environments because I mean, and you can see it sometimes, you'll, you'll, you'll notice it when you go to certain websites. Um, very often, if you go to a website and you're trying to figure out you, you need to do X, Y, or Z, and there's tons of calls to action, there's tons of things you could click on, there's pictures and GIFs and all kinds of fun things to distract you. Sometimes there's just too many choices and it's difficult to narrow in on the one that you want them to have. So let's, let's say that that's, that's the problem and this is the cognitive bias that we want to actually test. We say it's choice overload. There's just too many choices on our courses page. So in terms of creating some nudges um, or interventions, maybe you decide what you're going to do is a user interface redesign. Um, so you're gonna take a look at your page and say, what could we do differently in terms of designing here to make it easier for our new hires to select those courses that we need them to complete 
in a set amount of time. So this could be something like using some sort of a different listing logic. So maybe initially things are alphabetical or the newest is on top or whatever it might be, choose a different listing logic. Um, or maybe you have a much more obvious call to action um, for the courses that you need them to have, you know, big red flashing button um, or whatever it might be that actually draws their attention. And so even though there might be tons of choices there, you are helping to nudge them to the ones that they need to complete first. So in you know, defining or designing some sort of a study or an experiment, once again, you don't want to redesign the entire page. Maybe you want to test one thing at a time. Um, maybe you say, hey, if the mandatory courses are highlighted with clear time box calls to action, okay, um, or it's relocate, those courses are relocated to the top of your courses list, then new hires will complete the courses within the targeted first four weeks. So this is then something you would test. Um, and you would, I mean, in this case, you know, you're probably not testing on a control group, but maybe you redesign your page and you are testing then, your control group is essentially new hires prior to the redesign and new hires after the redesign. And if it works, then you can iterate on design elements. Um, you could potentially recommend um, different upskilling courses, whatever it might be. But this is essentially what the boost model um, would look like sort of in action. Okay. So at this point, I'm going to ask you to make sure you have your Mentimeter tab um, open because what I'd like to do is actually, you know, put on our, you know, put on our hats and try to figure out how we might be able to nudge our learners um, the way that we would like to nudge them. Um, so you are going to need then our Mentimeter once again. I'll give you a second to get back on there. All right. Oh, wait. Was there a question that just popped up in chat? Wait, where is this tab? Oh, if you, um, so hi, Lewis. If you go to uh, menti.com, so M-E-N-T-I.com, then you can put in this code. So this 905650, and then you'll pop up on here. Thank you. Great. Okay, so. Um, just to kind of give you some, some background here, present bias um, is the tendency of people to want something now rather than later. And so the desired result um, is, you know, even if that desired result in the future is super, super desirable, it sometimes seems really far away, right? So my question then would be, how, how could we divine, you know, design some sort of an intervention to counteract present bias? to help people to value that future outcome um, in the now and potentially make the right choice instead of doing something like, I don't know, go to Instagram, open up Netflix, whatever, whatever else they're doing instead of actually engaging in the type of behavior you want them to engage in. So you can go ahead and put, I think I have it set that you can um, insert multiple um, possible options, but go ahead. So make the long-term benefits measurable and viewable for the person. That's good. So a calendar that shows daily increments on a savings account. Oh, that's a, that's a perfect example. Whoever wrote that first one, I think you might have some background in behavioral economics. That's excellent. So mini rewards or discounts. Very good. Oh, definitely level celebrations. Um, we know this, chunking things, chunking things down and giving people incremental successes often helps out an awful lot. Right, giving people a hint of the future benefits. Very good. Nice. Yeah, the micro learning formats with badges, certificates. Um, it's funny because we, when we were talking about what to present tonight, we, we actually were discussing whether or not we want to talk a little bit about gamification. Um, but we thought that that might be a bit too much, but that might be something uh, to talk about a little bit um, in, at another Bear Learn um, 
fireside chat because gamification is actually a really good way to reframe and provide some sort of interventions. Nice. Providing them with a short-term benefit, which leads to a bigger reward at the end. Excellent. Very nice. All right, I'll give you maybe another 15, 20 seconds. And just so you know, when we, um, when we send out the final results uh, or the, fi the final slides here, I'll take some screenshots from Mentimeter. So all of the brainstorming um, that we have on these different slides will actually be viewable. So your ideas will not be lost. Okay, very nice. All right, so these are some really good ideas for, for interventions. Uh, once again, sometimes these are going to be design elements um, or they could be something more tangible, especially if you're in person, um, but you're definitely on the right track. So let's take, um, let's take a, a new bias here. Choice overload. Um, we talked about this a, a little bit earlier. Choice overload um, essentially is the, it's sometimes it's referred to as like decision fatigue. Um, this is when your learner just has so many choices that they are in some cases like paralyzed, unable to make a choice, or they default then to what's easiest. Okay, so what are some ways that we might be able to counteract choice overload? Absolutely. First of all, limit the choices. That's good. Um, whoever wrote that, think about like, what are some ways you could limit the choices? Just by listing fewer? Presenting choices in a different way. That is a good reframing tactic. <laughs> oh, that is an excellent point. People do love having choices, but they also hate making decisions. <laughs> exactly. I mean, this is something when we're thinking about adults and we're thinking about them being self-determined and, and you, know, have, you know, wanting to have control and autonomy, sometimes it, it does become a little bit challenging because they, you know, adults are a, a little bit more risk adverse, right? They're afraid of making the wrong decision. Sometimes they don't make a decision at all. Yeah. Sending notifications and reminders, excellent. And under, oh yeah, this is, a, this is a really good one. Let me talk about this for a second. So understanding the client or the person before offering all the options. This is something that if, if you're not already, or if you haven't um, heard of design thinking, um, or, or me, even if you're not using Addy, one of the key things to, to keep in mind is that you definitely want to empathize with your learner. And this is part of the reason why I, I can't at Babbel design for millions of Babbel learners at the same time. So I, I have to focus in on a specific group. Um, I really have to empathize with them and try to, you know, kind of imagine the entire learning journey from their perspective. What are their pain points along the way? What are their gain points? Um, so having a really good understanding um, of your key target audience before going in is huge. Yeah, listing fewer options, ah, breaking them into chunks, very good. Pointing out the choices for the most, you know, the most significant or most important along the learning path. Yeah, guiding, leading learners along the way. All excellent ideas. Oh, this is a good one too. That's a good UI design one. Um, so filtering based on a learner's needs and profiles. Let's grab this last one. Framing the choice, oh, I just missed it. Framing the choices as small and manageable. Very nice. Hey, you guys are doing, you guys are doing behavioral economics right now. Nice work. All right. Let's take, a, let's take another cognitive bias. I love this one. The worse than average effect. This is something that very often plagues adult learners. And as the name suggests, the worse than average um, effect is a bias where people tend to believe that they are worse than other people at a specific task. Um, so you hear this an awful lot. Oh, I'm terrible at math. Um, or, oh my gosh, statistics. I'm, I'm awful at this. Um, people tend to believe they are worse than average um, and they, that therefore very often um, they perceive certain tasks um, as incredibly difficult or something that would be incredibly difficult for them. 
personally. So what are some things that we could do to help counteract this worse than average effect? <laughs> yeah, worst possible ideas, good. All right, give them success. Yeah, definitely. Oh, excellent. This is a, that's a really good one. To be quite honest, that's, this, this, that's actually an intervention I personally have designed for at Babel. Giving the, the learner that, that sense of what they've already accomplished. Um, it makes it feel, you know, you give them that little bit of confidence along the way and they start to build up, um, build up a little bit more confidence that they can be successful in the future if they've been successful in the past. So, yeah, good. Showing progress in a motivational way. Nice. Having a cheerleader while learning. Very good. Also very good. Um, I'm not sure I wrote the set relation to oneself, not others. Show progress, not a competitive view. It's a really good point um, to pick up because you do see very often in gamified type experiences. I mean, one of the one of the key elements that we tend to associate with gamification is leaderboards. So you think of PBL, points, badges, leaderboards. Um, and for a, a learner who is blocked by this worse than average effect, having a leaderboard can be intensely demotivating. Um, so that would be actually one gamification uh, strategy. I would you know say, hey. Keep, keep that in the back of your mind. Excellent. Depending on the topic and learning environment, I just say things this is just for fun. Oh yeah, creating a sandbox. So like, in other words, a, a lower pressure or like a lower stakes type environment. Excellent. Very nice. I, I will say, by the way, the worst and average effect is actually quite a difficult cognitive bias um, to design for. So, but you guys have some really, really good suggestions. All right, I'm going to move to the next one. The law of the instrument. Um, the law of the instrument, and for those of you that work in e-learning or blended learning environment, this one is definitely for you. The law of the instrument is like an over-reliance on a familiar tool um, or method um, and, a, and sometimes ignoring or devaluing or undervaluing alternative approaches. Um, I find this in language learning quite a lot because most of us did learn, uh, so most adults did learn a language at some point in school, right? Um, depending on how you were educated, maybe you had tons of flashcards or verb conjugation tables and people tend to think, these are, the, these are the only tools that I can use to learn a language. And they might then maybe devalue or undervalue alternative tools. So how can we you know, counteract or break our adult learners out of the mindset that there's only a you know, set of very familiar tools um, or methods to help them reach their goals? Good, yeah, show them new tools in action. Excellent. Yeah, providing a variety of new tools, social proof. Um, so social proof is essentially, I mean, we see this an awful lot, like, con you know, so confirmation when we see other people doing something. So sometimes providing testimonials or social proof helps to um, nudge someone to try out a new tool, especially when they're, it's a little bit unfamiliar to them. Ah, that's a good point. Why not Tr give them different tools and ask them to think about, compare, <laughs> trick them into using it. 
Also a good design tactic. Nice. Yeah, designing unusual experiences, something that, um, something, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to think of the best way to say this. Sometimes we can take, and we tend to think of um, learning experiences from a specific, you know, sort of a specific way. Um, you know, we scaffold, we provide the input, we provide the guided practice, then the independent practice, that sort of thing. Um, but sometimes flipping the experience and trying something a little bit different, um, or potentially taking that slightly gamified approach, um, where instead of just completing a lesson, they're solving a riddle, or you know, they're looking, they're not just you know taking notes um, um, or pulling out the most important details, but rather they're looking for clues along the way. So those are some different ways you can take a, a traditional experience, um, make it into an unusual experience, and then provide them with different sorts of tools. Yeah. Make them curious, yeah, you can definitely tease something. Excellent, yeah, this is a really good, so two people mentioned, you know, providing multiple tools, um, and you, and both of you picked up on something very important, which is don't just give your learners tons of tools and just say, hey, use one, but actually ask them to do a little bit of reflection. Even just a quick survey um, at the end of an experience would, might be enough to give them um, some, you know, give them some personal insights um, to help break them out of this, you know, this rut that they might be in, in terms of instruments. Excellent. Very good. Oh, yeah, good. Give them examples of success with that tool. Okay. Oh, I think, sorry, I think I missed one. Where should it go? Sorry, all of a sudden a Mentimeter is just flipping through all of my slides. Let me give it a second. I'm just gonna reload the screen. Okay, okay, there we go. <laughs> all right, so already you're starting to think, um, think like a behavioral um, economist. Um, so when we think about these different types of biases, and I'm actually going to go back to my first screen. When we think about all of these different types of biases, and once again, there's hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, the key to make this actionable um, for you in your day to day is to really kind of think a little bit like a, a scientist, um, in the sense that we don't just want to randomly, you know, pick up a behavioral, um, you know, a cognitive bias or, or something like that and say, well, let, let's try to design for this. But actually spend some time getting to know the, the learners um, that you are trying to design the experience for. Try to figure out what behaviors, so not just what are they not doing, but what are they doing instead of what they should, you know, the, of what they should be doing. Um, those types of things really help to provide a baseline that can narrow down these hundreds of biases into something slightly more actionable for you um, so that you can actually focus in on a specific bias, design some interventions around them, and then actually create something that you can test. Now, I mentioned this thing about, you know, empathizing with your learner. One thing that I, I would mention, I, I don't know how many of you have access to, you know, maybe end of course or, you know, cancellation surveys or whatever else it might be, but when you're thinking about your core target learner, you don't just want to focus in on that specific group and what that group doesn't do. You want to focus on what the successful um, learners do as well. And so it can provide a little bit of balance in terms of trying to empathize with the learner and think about their entire experience. Now, when, when I'm doing this at Babel, I don't look at that single behavior and say, why aren't they doing this one thing? I don't look at, say, like that one screen in our app and try to figure out, you know, what is it on this specific screen that's making it difficult? I map out the entire learning journey. And when I do that, for me, that means I start in terms of empathizing with the learner and thinking about where they are before they even open the Babel app. So I map out the full learning journey from before they 
you know, open the app. I try to imagine what triggers them um, to decide to click on uh, the Babbel icon on their phone or open Babbel on their browser, on their laptop or, you know, computer. I try to imagine that, and then I try to go through the entire journey uh, with them. And along the way, I try to think about where they had those different pain points. And that is one of the ways that I can narrow down all of these cognitive biases and try to zone in on the ones that I think are the most impactful in terms of blocking my, my learner from achieving what they want. So in other words, what's responsible for that intention action gap? So um, at this point, I'm going to um, open the floor up to questions. Um, and then we are also going to be doing just like a quick little, you know, wrap up towards the end. But I want to make sure first that we have uh, enough time for, for everyone's questions. So I'll open up the chat here. But Millie, if there are questions that have popped up on Slido, can you yes. unmute yourself? And I'm back here. Um, and I think just to kind of follow up to, to what you just said, we had this question like, how do you define and determine which bias do you want to focus on? So you now mentioned like the UX approach, user research that you, mm -hmm. you would do. Is there any tool that you would recommend? So like to walk us a little bit, what formats would you use, especially if we have like a broad audience? So anything that can help us actually identify what are the biases we want to focus on? I mean, it, it kind of depends on how, how, many, how many people are in your user group, okay? Um, because the best kind of data is, is usually like sort of qualitative data. Um, I tend to have to use a lot of quantitative data because it's, it's impossible for me to follow someone, you know, follow a Babel user outside, outside the app. And so when we talk about like the quantitative data, we're bucketing um, tons of users that have similar behavior patterns together. And we're trying to make some assumptions about that type of learner as opposed to that specific learner. So as much as possible, I try to balance out the quantitative data um, that I get with some qualitative. And so this is where like really like user research comes in in terms of interviews. Um, of course, you know, with an interview, then you have a little bit of the observer's uh, paradox there because when you are actually interviewing someone, it's sometimes a little bit challenging um, because people who do participate um, or are willing to participate in a one-on-one -on -one interview, um, recognize that, or very often, they, they want to give you what you want. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes you have to temper that a little bit, which is why I look at both quantitative and qualitative data. Um, you can also provide them um, a little bit of qualitative data via anonymous surveys. Uh, that helps out an awful lot. Um, but for me, the key is not just focusing in on one specific thing. Um, so I wouldn't, for instance, base all of my decisions on a single person who wrote a review on the app store or a single person who sent an email to customer service. Um, rather, I would look at broad behavior, you know, broad behavior in terms of quantitative data. I would look at what we can get in terms of qualitative interviews and surveys. Um, and then, of course, I also want to balance that with best practice. So I, I don't just look at just what we get from the users per se. I also look at what do we know about language acquisition? What do we know about how adults learn? What, about, what do we know about best practices in using digital um, interfaces, so e-learning uh, type platforms um, to help learners learn? So I would balance all of that um, to help narrow down to a specific bias that I want to test. And by the way, when I, when I do, do these tests, I'm never just testing a single bias. Um, I mean, I'll design an intervention on a single bias, but I usually have identified several biases that I'll test independently. Yeah, and I think a nice, a nice here is just as a former, do you also use uh, focus groups as, a, as something? I don't know how that's possible, but... Um... Uh, we, we have occasionally, uh, it's become a bit more challenging in the era of coronavirus. Yeah. Um, but yeah, a, a focus group is nice, but the one thing is once again, um, when you do run a focus group or even when we do run interviews, it's really important to not have the person who has the vested interest um, in, you know, in the outcome be the person asking the questions. Um, so I never personally interview learners. Rather, we have a UX research team that interviews the learners on our behalf. And you know, we develop the, you know, the script, the questions, that sort of thing. And the very first thing our interviewers say is, I don't design the app. Nothing you, nothing, nothing you say, um, you know, will offend me. 
you know, be honest. And it, it creates a little bit of distance, um, but you, you still do have people that, you know, don't give you maybe quite as honest feedback as you would like in that sort of setting. Yeah, I like very much this um, approach of like blending the, the, the quantitative in data that platforms give us and then in engaging with the audience as well to, to learn more. Um, one thing that pop up is, has any behavioral research has been done at Babel based on nationality of user? I'm sorry, based, uh, could you repeat the question? I didn't hear it. So has any behavioral research, have you been doing that ba in Bab at Babel based on nationality of the user? Oh, yes, definitely. Um, and, and there are, there are certain um, generalizations, um, but there are certain behavior patterns we, we tend to see more in, um, you know, with certain display languages, so certain, um, so, so from certain countries, for instance, and, and that can help us to narrow things down a little bit. Um, but it's not, it, it's actually not so much, it's, that's not as prevalent um, an indicator. So nationality, for instance, is not as prevalent an indicator as is the motivation that people um, select. When they first, you know, register for Babel, for instance, they, they give us an understanding of what's motivating them. Is it because of family and friends? Do they, are they learning this language for, for work purposes? Um, for travel, whatever, um, the motivation is actually a slightly more precise um, indicator. Great. Um, and maybe for me, that's also what I would like to do. If I would now go back to my company um, and we launch this um, knowledge base and I, I am learning from data, where does the focus go and where maybe the engage, engagement goes high, where it goes very low. Um, what would you suggest in terms of like understanding the biases that are within my context, within my, my company? Because it's, you said like you combine the data and then you see best practices for, for example, corporate trainings or, you know, like would you then suggest like to see what are the best practices when it comes to my, to my field and my ecosystem uh, in order to see what, what can be done there? I mean, definitely. And, and one of the things too, is that when, when you do have a good sort of like research base and a, a knowledge, you know, like a knowledge base of what best practices are in, in your ecosystem, so in your environment, um, it helps you better to die, you know, it helps you better to map out sort of an optimal learning flow, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So not necessarily thinking of a specific user, but thinking of a successful user um, and map out the flow of what would this person do from start to finish? Um, what are all the decisions they would, they would make to make them, you know, to enable them to be successful? Um, because one of the biggest challenges, to be quite honest, um, it, it's not even trying to identify the bias, it's trying to identify the specific behaviors that mm -hmm. contribute to your, your larger outcome. Um, and so you want your behaviors to be sort of small enough that there is probably a, a, you know, for the most part, a single decision point um, that would impact that behavior. Um, if you can do that and map out those behaviors, then for those specific behaviors, when you have that specific behavior, when you look at the flow that you map out, so whether it's a user journey or sketching or whatever, it's a little bit easier than to say, okay, well, maybe the reason why they're not making the decision to start a lesson um, or start a review session is because let, let's look at the screen, what right here, what is their, what might be their pain point when they get to the, the part of their journey where they have a decision, do I do a lesson, do I do a review, do I close the app, that sort of thing. Um, so having that knowledge basis of what would be, what would it take for someone to be successful? What are the specific behaviors along that way that would make someone successful? Um, and that helps you to narrow down a set of um, biases. I mean, really, if you're putting yourself in the mind, like really doing that, that sort of empathy mapping um, with that target group that you're considering, like maybe you have a persona in mind, that helps you to narrow this down a little bit more. And when you make decisions or what interventions, let's say you want to um, adapt on a high level, right? So it's going mm -hmm. to, for example, like really big change on the app that is going to affect a bigger resource and you have to make this decision. I'm just imagining, you know, engineering team has a very different behavioral pattern than maybe marketing or sales and you try to create something for everyone. So when you try to make a decision, okay, what is the intervention we want to do? Can you explain what would be the approach there? How do you basically, um, decide on such a thing? I mean, for the most part, I mean, the first thing I would say about that is that 
you, you, I mean, just like anyone who's ever been in front of a classroom, not everyone is going to, um, not, not, every, not everyone in your audience is going to connect with the way you're presenting something or the, the tools that you're providing. I mean, it's not always gonna resonate with everyone because especially with adult learners, you know, they are, they have had enough experience and they do come with a lot of that baggage that influences how they feel about learning in general. Um, so I think one danger would be to say, I'm going to try to design something that fits everyone. I mean, you could potentially create um, some sort of a nudge or an intervention that's like a unicorn, like with flowing, you know, I don't know, sh you know, shooting rainbows out of its eyes or whatever. <laughs> you could define, you could come up with something like that, but that would be super, super rare. Um, so normally, when you're thinking about um, figuring out like what what can I what can I do to help my the the new engineers in my company um, take this particular course or sign up for this particular training because we know it'll help them be successful. Try to think about just that specific group when you're designing an, an intervention. And maybe it can be targeted. It doesn't always have to be some, you know, a nudge or an intervention that is viewable to everyone else. I mean, that's the, the great thing about working with adults and having this sort of digital, commu you know, digital communication ch uh, channels or diversity of communication channels is that you can, even if you only have a single website or a single set of trainings, you still can nudge different groups differently based on the pain points um, or potentially the biases that might block them from doing that. I mean, push notifications, if you have an app, is a great way to do that because you can target just specific groups. Um, but if you don't have, you know, an app with push notifications, simple, you know, email, so buckets of, of users and they get a different sort of pattern of emails um, that, you know, nudge them to take the courses or the trainings um, that you want them to. Yeah, great. So segmenting um, the audience. That's cool. So we have two more questions. There are some votes within L&D that personas are limiting and are categorizing the learners in a way that restricts uh, successful solution design. Do you agree? Uh, yes and no. Um, I, I do think that it, okay, so, uh, well, let me answer this by saying how, how I use personas. Babel does have user personas. Yep, and they're, they're designed for our marketing department and our product designers um, to work with. And what I tend to do is if I'm working from the framework or I'm starting my discovery process or my design sprint with a specific persona in mind, I don't just limit myself to that persona. I, I, can, I use a, a tool called an empathy map. Um, it's something that, I mean, actually you just Google it, empathy map is something that a lot of agile um, teams use as a key artifact. Um, but the empathy map actually has you take that persona, think about the opportunity space you're working in. So in other words, what, what is this, you know, ultimate outcome? And then you think about what does this particular person see and hear in their environment? What do they say and do? What are some of the things that they might articulate as you know, their goals or their, their outcomes and their challenges? And then when you actually go through and create a full flow of the entire learning experience from start to finish, and I'm not talking about, once again, just a specific training course, but imagine what, it would, what you know, this flow is starting before they even decide to register for a, a training, for instance, to the point where they feel the accomplishment at the end. They're able to actually put whatever they're being trained on, they're able to put it into use in their real life, their day to day. Map that out after you do it, your, your empathy mapping and take a look at the flow along the way. And that's one way that you can avoid the trap of being too like sort of stuck into a persona um, that is, is maybe rigid because that's what your company or that, you know, that they, they said, this is the, your personas. That's my way of breaking out of that mold and not getting stuck and limited um, by a set persona. So empathy mapping, user journey, uh, flow mapping, all from that perspective of that persona. Once again, if you Google empathy maps, there's tons of great resources online to give you an example of how people use that. Great. Um, we have a question. Uh, what is the problem with the humor effect in the bias list? <laughs> it's not so much a problem as it is, um, so, okay, well, first of all, people tend to remember things that are novel um, and, and humorous. So it could be a bias in the sense, and my, probably my father would, would um, jump in on this, um, but here's the problem. Let's say you, are, you have a training program and some, you have a class clown, you know, your typical class clown. What are people more likely to remember at the end of your training program? 
probably the funny little things and the little anecdotes and the little side comments that your class clown um, decided to inject um, in the experience than what you actually wanted to take away. So the humor effect is actually not, I mean, it could be a blocker because it could distract people from the real important takeaways, but actually that's one that you can leverage um, and by leverage, I mean you can design humor or some unexpected little twists along the way uh, to kind of, you know, create a little bit more of that, you know, engaging focus um, for your user or learner. That's a great one. I have the feeling that you already know so many of these biases and how to then transfer, transfer them in something that you can build. It's, it's really cool. And my personal question is like for your own pattern, like in behaviorals, like have you, do you do this kind of checks for yourself? Like what are your current biases and how does that look like as someone who is designing? Do you have this self-reflection? Yeah. yeah, I'm plagued with it actually. Mm -hmm. um, it makes it really difficult at the end of a weekend, you know, at the beginning of my weekend, I'm like, oh, these are all the things that I'm going to be doing. And then it comes to Sunday evening and I'm like, what happened? To, what happened to my weekend? What happened to all this stuff? Um, and I very often find myself recognizing, well, I chose to do, you know, X instead of Y. And probably that's because, you know, and I'll... <laughs> Yeah, it, it really is. It's like it's, it's it's kind of opening a Pandora's box. Once once you learn these, you can't unlearn them. Actually, yeah, I can definitely. So this is, I think, all from the slide. Oh, I hope I haven't um, missed anything. So yeah, I think we are complete with the questions. Unless someone wants to put something uh, within the chat. Okay. So feel free to yeah, do. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, Jennifer, you can. Yeah take over right now. Yeah, I would just say I'd, I'd like to get um, some of your key takeaways from this evening's chat. Oh, yeah, there are some really, some, some excellent articles um, online. The Atlantic has written a, a couple of really, really good sort of probing pieces on cog you know, cognitive biases, so awesome. Oh, feeling like you wanna learn each bias? Start now and in 2021. <laughs> you might um, get them all. But that's part of the reason why, honestly, on the takeaway, I, I indicated these are the top ones. These are the ones, these are my go-tos. These are the ones I use an awful lot because there really are so, so many. Yeah, if you like the boost model, um, once again, I would absolutely so recommend um, signing up for the Impactually uh, Designing Nudges course. I, I it's not very expensive. I think it's maybe 50 euros and it's a self-paced course with videos and a really awesome sort of workbook where, you know, you can actually identify a real challenge that you have in your day to day. And over the course of, of, of the, over the course of the course, actually design some interventions for us. So that's really a, it's a fantastic one. I can't recommend that more highly. Excellent. Thank you very much. So then, <laughs> My, my last question um, for you before I let you all go is, which cat best match, mass, matches how you feel after this fireside chat? Are you the excited cat? Are you the curious cat? The bored cat? The confused cat? <laughs> I actually think that's technically grumpy cat, but I decided to make him look confused. <laughs> Nice, excited and curious. Good. That was that was my that was my hopeful outcome. Yeah, uh, I think this, this is an excellent feedback. Yeah, and then give me my last one, roti. So, return on time invested. So, you you spent an hour and a half with us. What what you know hour and a half of your busy day. For some of you, this might've been your lunch hour. Um, some of you, this is your dinner hour. So what did you think? Return on time invested. Thanks. Very good. All right, then. Wrapping things up from my end, once again, um, I, I'll send you some slides 
And I will make sure that I actually take the screenshots, so export all of, so all of our you know, brainstorming. I'll make sure we export them so all of your ideas also get um, inserted into the slides. I have a lot of links in there, so please feel free to um, check out some of those links. There is a lot of information online about behavioral economics and how it uh, relates to learning environments. Um, so hopefully you get a chance to try some of these out. And at the minimum, it's a really different, it's, it's kind of a different way to you know, think about how to go about redesigning or iterating on um, course or, or training type designs. All right, so thank you everyone. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. All right. I hope that everyone had a good time and yeah. Yeah, thank uh, you so much also on our behalf. This was excellent. I think we will have more occasions to talk and maybe deep dive in specific uh, topics within this uh, big topic. So stay tuned and um, we will share all the resources as we mentioned before together with the recording so you can go back and explore and check everything. I'm sure I'm going to sign up for the course you mentioned. I think it's uh, my next step, but let's see if I'm going to do it. It's my intention, but let's see if it's going to happen. <laughs> well, now think about which bias that prevents you from doing that if you don't. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you so much for being with us and enjoy the rest of the evening. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye.